You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Sarah Gay Forden on the show with me. She has an amazing book that you probably have heard of, and, and I know that you've heard of the movie tie-in uh, that is that is coming out uh, very shortly. Well, when you're hearing this episode, I believe the movie will have released. Uh, it's The House of Gucci, and uh, a sensational story of murder, madness, glamour, and greed. What a fantastic story. This is one of the most amazing books of narrative nonfiction that you will ever read. Uh, the book has been uh, out for a while, but uh, now with the movie coming out and this getting the film treatment that we always knew that it that it w- that it deserved. Um, you know, we're talking about the book again, and I'm excited to have you on the show today. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Hank. It's it's a great to be here. Absolutely. Um, Sarah, before we get started, we begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? You know, it's a great question. And it took me right back to the family dinner table in my home growing up. And we would often have conversations about writing and what was good writing. And I think I always just assumed that I was going to be a writer. And my um, grandfather was a writer. My mother was a writer. Um, my father um, worked for the government, but he was also very um, intent on, on the importance of clear, good writing. And uh, I could tell you a little story about that because he actually worked for the CIA. He was a cold warrior and he was all about, you know, trying to help people in, in the Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union um, move closer to our way of life and he said you know if you're out in the field and you got to send a cable back to the guy on the desk at Langley you got to make sure that you are writing clearly and he understands exactly what you need him to do because somebody's life could be in the brink wow that's uh yeah I mean that gets right to the heart of it you know be say say what you mean be understood and and get to the point that's uh that that's some advice that that goes across the board for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, Sarah, um, you spent uh, a number of years reporting on the fashion industry. Uh, wh- what was it that initially fascinated you with fashion and and uh, piqued your interest in, into this form of of artistic expression? You know, I really um, started my career as a business uh, reporter in Italy, and that was just um, because I had been there in grad school. I learned Italian. I fell in love with Italy. I fell in love with an Italian. And so I was getting my my start, and I I wasn't um, initially intent on covering the fashion industry. I just wanted to tell like compelling business stories about interesting people. And it didn't take me very long to realize that the big business in Milan where I was living was the fashion industry. And it was right at the time when these, you know, Italian brands like Gucci and and Armani and Versace were exploding from being, you know, rather small uh, family owned boutique um, shops to being mega brands. And so it was actually a very exciting time to be reporting on fashion. And then, of course, it's a fun industry because it's it's alive, it's colorful, it's, you know, got its finger on the pulse. You know, these are these are people who have to figure out how to sell you more things that you don't need. And so it's always by creating something new (laughs) and alluring and compelling about the product. So so um, it was really quite a time, I think, also in the evolution of the Italian fashion and luxury goods industry that I, you know, started reporting um, first for Women's Wear Daily and then later writing the book and then for Bloomberg. 
Do you think that there's something intrinsically Italian about this uh, this end of the fashion industry and the luxury goods industry that maybe we don't quite understand as Americans uh, that that there's um, is, is this part of Italian culture that um, d- does this I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, um, you know, is it could could an industry like this have happened in America or is this something that is uh, it, intrinsically Italian? That's a that's a really great question. Um, you know, Italy is very, um, you know, the, the way things look um, is very important to Italians, probably more than to Americans. And so they take a lot of care in, you know, people, how they dress, how they move, how they interact. It's, it's you know, the whole um, concept of the bella figura isn't just that you're looking beautiful, but that you're also appropriate for whatever the, the setting is. And um, what I learned as a reporter covering the industry was that it's, but it's deeper than the surface. It's deeper, it was deeper than the last outfit, you know, on their money runway, because there was a whole um, fabric, literally, of textile and leather goods manufacturing in Italy, in different regions. And it was the yarns, you know, that were spun into the fabrics that were woven, and then the fabrics that were then presented at the trade fairs, and then the designers, buyers would go and and buy the fabrics. And so when you saw, let's say, you know, a dark, you know, sort of um, purple velvet jacket at Armani, like there was a whole story behind that jacket that went far beyond even Armani. It was, it was this, this industry, um, that was behind it. Interesting. So, so what years were you in Italy reporting on the industry? So I moved to Milan in 1988 and I was at that point, just a general business reporter. And I started writing about the industry actually for, I was, I was working for Dow Jones at the time. So my first stories were published in the wall street journal in like the early nineties. And then I moved to women's wear daily in 1993. And that's when I really, you know, that was like the Bible, right. Of the fashion industry. And so that's when I was kind of fully immersed in the Italian fashion industry, um, and I was writing as the business reporter, so I wasn't reviewing the clothes. I was writing about the business. So you were right in the thick of it uh, during the time of the Gucci murder. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was actually I was running to the office that morning, and I got a call from my reporter saying, "Sarah, you wouldn't believe what just happened. Maurizio Gucci was shot." What what did that do to, you know, as someone who was kind of on the ground uh, there, what were the the aftershocks of this news? It was incredibly shocking for everybody because nothing like that happened in Milan. I mean, people were not just gunned down in cold blood on the street as they were going to work. Um, You know, you read about the, the, the mafia and the gang, you know, um, fights in Napoli and, and, and other um, Sicilian towns, but it was not part of the sort of the backdrop of Milan. Milan was a very, um, you know, Northern European industrial city. They had big, you know, the, all the big companies were there. The stock market was there. You know, it was like the New York of Italy. And it was just unheard of that somebody would be murdered in cold blood like that. So I would imagine that um, being in the industry like you were at the time and reporting on it, that for days and weeks and probably months, there was breaking news uh, that that was uh, that you were covering about kind of as the story unfolded and, you know, all of the aftershocks of, you know, how this affected the industry and how it affected the families and all of that. Well, as the the dust sort of settles on it and and uh, you get a chance to look back over the events that happened, when do you start seeing the threads of a story? Um, you know, because when when things are just happening, you're you're kind of reporting on things as they happen. And it's sort of the frenzy of it all. It, it's not until later that you get to look back and get some perspective and see the whole story of what happened. Um, yeah. When did you start sort of seeing the landscape of this story? 
So he was killed in 1995, and I was still covering the industry. And then um, his ex-wife wasn't arrested for the murder until two years later. So there were full two years where they didn't know who had done it. So it was like this unsolved mystery. And that was in 97. And I started, in the meantime, you know, Maurizio had not been in control of the Gucci brand when he was killed. It had been taken over by Investcorp. And that's when Tom Ford started um, designing for it. And it's, uh, he started just blowing it out of the park. And so at the same time that there was this um, kind of, you know, the whole murder mystery was in limbo, um, Gucci was just like soaring and it was the hottest brand in fashion. And it was around then that I started thinking, well, maybe there's a there's a narrative here that's not all tragic. You know, there's a rise in the fall and then there's a rise again. And so I actually started um, doing my work on you know, pitching it and doing the proposal in 97 um, after after Patrizia was arrested for the murder. So at that point, there was some clarity about what the story was. So did you. So, like you said, there was some clarity to what the story was then. That how do you start kind of mapping out what the the narrative thread that you're going to follow? Because because like you said, you, you know, you realize that there was a a rise, a fall, a rise again. Y- you must have had a narrative thread in mind that you wanted to follow. How how do you start laying that out and finding the lay of the land, if you will? Well, I'll tell you that, but actually, before I do, I want to go back to kind of how the idea came together. Yes, absolutely. Since you're you're interested in writers and the story behind the writers, and um, I had always wanted to write a book, and I think I think a lot of journalists um, find they have that itch, and yet I knew that it wasn't going to be a novel because I'm a journalist, and so I write about real things that happen, and I couldn't figure out what I was going to write a book about, and um one summer I was home I'm from the the DC area and I was home visiting family in in northern Virginia and the Arlington County had just opened a new library and the cool thing about and this is dating myself but the cool thing about the new <laughs> library was that in place in the research uh, department in place of the old card catalog which had been moved to the side there was a computer so I thought, OK, let's see what this computer can do. And I walked up and I typed in Gucci. And this was the era of the 10 blue links, you know, and you would search right. something and it spits out 10 blue links. And of those 10 stories, eight of them I had written. Oh, wow. And that's when the light bulb went off in my head. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's Gucci. I know something about Gucci. I can write it. I can write a book about Gucci because I know the players and, and I can get them to help me because, you know, you need facts. Right. And, and you 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 need to piece together the story and you need people who are going to help you tell the story so that's when the light bulb went off dabble is a proud sponsor of author stories dabble is an easy to use cloud-based writing tool that gives writers a way to organize plot and create amazing stories wherever they are write in our desktop app on your mac or windows computer tablet or mobile device dabble syncs your latest version with the cloud on all your devices Write anywhere and anytime inspiration strikes. We got you. Dabble is my preferred writing tool, and I think it will be yours as well. Visit DabbleWriter.com for your free trial. You have an amazing story idea. You execute the writing and editing flawlessly, and now the only thing missing are readers. We can help you go from author to author superhero with Story Origin. Story Origin is a one-stop shop for marketing tools with a community of amazing authors working together to find reviewers, build mailing lists, increase sales, and collect feedback from beta readers. Everything an author needs, all in one place from providing review copies or beta copies, reader magnets to ensure you stay connected with readers, easily distribute audio promo codes, universal retail links to send readers directly to the proper point of purchase, or provide direct download links for members of your mailing list. Story Origin has all the tools you need in one easy-to-use site. Use the promo code ASP21 at checkout when subscribing to the yearly plan, and you will get 10% off your first year. 
This code will expire December 31st, so hurry over and subscribe now. StoryOriginApp.com that is so funny, Sarah, that <laughs> that um, you're looking for an expert and you realize that you are the expert. I was the expert. It like <laughs> hit me. It just hit me over the head like, oh, it was sitting right in front of me and I hadn't seen it. Um, so then, um, you know, in the process, I was like, well, how am I going to do this? Do I need an agent? Um, I felt very kind of far, you know, far offshore, you know, long way away in, in Milan. And my I had friends in Milan who worked in publishing and they gave me three names. And the first one was Ellen Levine, who was also the agent on the English patient. And they said, you know, start with Ellen. If she takes you, then don't, don't call the others. And so I started with Ellen and she, you know, I was going to New York and I told her I attached some clips and I told her I wanted to do a book on Gucci and she gave me an appointment. So that's how our relationship started. And then you have to write a proposal because, you, you know, she needs something to take to the publisher. So a proposal is a very um, detailed, you know, marketing document, which says, you know, what's the book going to be? You know, why are you the person to write it? Who is going to read it? And part of that proposal, you have to map out a chapter outline and a sample chapter. So that's when I started sort of shaping the narrative. Um, and notwithstanding, and, and so, and we took it to like 10 publishers. It's not, it wasn't obvious that, that, that the publishing world thought this was going to be a great book for the U.S. market. Um, but uh, HarperCollins, uh, actually at the time it was William Morrow, um, they saw the potential and they, and they took it. Um, but then, despite the fact that I had mapped out that great chapter outline, when I actually started writing the book, I had this in incredible writer's block. And I, I, I wrote for like two months and I just was going around in circles and I couldn't like write my way out of the box. And I finally just put everything that I've been working on aside and I started in with, um, with the past. And that part where you go in the first chapter from the murder. I mean, I always knew the murder was going to be the first chapter, but then I wasn't sure how to move from there. And I ended up um, going back to that, those pages and I took all that material out and they ended up going into like three different chapters. Um, but I, I think to your point about the narrative, I think that when you're writing a book, there comes this moment um, when you've done all your research where you have to kind of get lost in the material and in the characters, even though it's not a novel, I was writing it like a novel. Sure. You know, I was I was um, drawing on the sort of the techniques of so-called literary journalism that I had studied, you know, in college as an English major and really wanted to use the tools of fiction to write this nonfiction saga. And so I, you know, it's like so far it's my first book and my only book and I definitely want to write another book. But I think um, I'm not sure that it gets easier necessarily, you know, if you're not. Yeah writing from a formula and I do think you have to go through that kind of uncomfortable period where you're just kind of lost in the material and mucking around and trying to sort it out. You, you mentioned a couple of times, Sarah, this this idea of uh, writing a piece of journalism, but pulling from the, the tools, if you will, of fiction writers and writing uh, a piece of nonfiction, but writing it in such a way that it's as engaging as a novel. Um, when, when you say things like that, my, my first reaction is, you know, how come all nonfiction isn't, isn't that way? Like, why do we write things that are dry and, um, you know, just because we're, you're giving us facts, why can't you do it in an engaging way? Um, and you know, and that's neither here nor there. Um, but, uh, what what are some of those tools that you kind of pulled out that that fiction writers used, but then you incorporated to tell this this 100 percent true story, but in a way that keeps us turning the pages? And 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 in a lot of cases, this is a story that that we all knew something about. You know, if we read the news or watched a. Uh, uh, you know, some newscast, you, you kind of had a, a general idea of what the story was. Um, 
but we didn't know everything that we know after we read your book. Yeah, well, to me, the key was really deep, deep research and and you need. So for me, it was all about setting the scenes, right? And and bringing people into the room, into the context and down the street. You know, I talk a lot about the buildings. Um, I talk about who's in the room at the meetings, you know, when I can, who's wearing what. I mean, so every interview, I, I did more than 100 interviews. And a lot of times in the interviews, we were retreading kind of old ground that I already knew. But in every interview, I would get some new fresh nugget that I could add to the story. And I, I often thought about it like stringing a, a pearl necklace. Like I would get a pearl and then I would go out and do another interview. And, and maybe it was, you know, an hour or two spent, you know, just kind of retreading facts that I already knew. But then in every one, there would be this other pearl that I could come back and add to my necklace. And so I think it was the the detail that then allowed me to write in a compelling way that brought the reader into the story and into the scene. By by doing so many interviews and getting the same story in a lot of cases from m- many different people, um, did that give you a perspective um, to sort of have a, a three-dimensional view of the story? Uh, because even though they were the same facts a lot of times, um, perspective from different people does does that give you tools as a writer does does that give you information that helps to to tell a more um a a better more full story absolutely and there are things that like people would corroborate you know because i'm uh, you know everybody sees the story in their own way and one of the big challenges i had with the gucci story was that everybody was at odds with each other right so everybody wanted to tell a different story and had a different perspective <laughs> and so so one of the things i had to do was really try to um take a little bit from each perspective and figure that the truth was going to be somewhere in the middle Oh, that's and, fascinating. You know, so I had to kind of even things out and, you know, like the, like the cousins, you know, had a view and Maurizio had a view and Patrizia had a view. And so it was it was also talking to people to try to get their perspective on who, you know, who was right or who or how can I how can I accommodate all these different perspectives in the way that I'm writing the story. How you said can that I you make them all jive, you know? right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, with all of the interviews that you did, more than a hundred, um, how difficult was it to get access to to the players uh, in, involved in this? And it, because f- from an outsider's perspective, it it would seem like this was probably a very well guarded uh, industry, and and the the families involved. And, and how difficult was it to get access? You know, I was very straightforward and I went to the family. I ended up working quite a bit with Roberto and Giorgio, who were the son, two sons of Aldo. Um, Maurizio was dead. Patrizio was in jail. You know, so it was difficult um, just because a lot of the people weren't available to me. But but they really I really, you know, I think I I conveyed to them that I wasn't just going to write like, you know, a quick sort of splashy you know piece i really wanted to understand kind of the roots of their family and the the family business and how it came to be and and so they they really you know gave me a lot of information and obviously you know about their father about their grandfather about how the family worked about how the factories worked and and um and then i i was able to get to there were a lot of of people who had worked for the company for years you know, they were very loyal and they felt kind of part of the family. And so um, people who just had long memories Um, and even De Sole, who who ended up becoming, you know, the CEO and leading Gucci into a new era of sort of being a multi-brand group. He he was the one who had the longest arc of time in in the company with the family because he started um, as Rodolfo Gucci's lawyer. So he saw the whole arc of the family you know, interactions. And he was often at the board meetings, you know, that I describe um, in the book where where they're fighting over money and offshore accounts. And, you know, the famous one where Paolo gets hit in the head with the tape recorder and runs from the (laughs) Tolnaborni offices bleeding. 
you know, calling for his lawyer. Um, talking about finding, um, you know, everyone's uh, different experience with it and finding what the truth is. Um, I've heard it say before, heard it said before that um, when when dealing with an argument between people, there's his side, there's her side, and then there's the truth somewhere in the middle. Um, how do you, as a journalist, um, getting all of these people's personal story and experience with this, how do you find the truth? Well, it's really that process that I was talking about before where you have to kind of take, everybody has their own truth, and then you have to try to feel your way along and figure out where the the real truth is most likely. Um, So I think it's a combination of your judgment and who you find most believable and, um, and the range of information that you have. Here, uh, here in the states, th- this book has been a a, a wild success uh, through the years. How was this story and this book that you wrote received um, in in Italy the, uh, amongst the the fashion elites? You know, it wasn't published um, for years in Italy. Um, all the big publishers turned it down. Really, and I always wondered if maybe the family had somehow kind of moved against it. Um, I was never able to confirm that, but what I was told was that um, it was, you know, it it was really all over the Italian papers. And so it's possible that in those days, the publishers didn't feel there'd be enough readership because people had already read so much of the story in the press. Um, So now it's um, going to be published by Garzanti, which is a, a wonderful Italian publisher. So I'm very excited about that. Absolutely. Um, it, it's also coming out as a film uh, starring Adam Driver and uh, and Lady Gaga. That How does that make you feel? Well, it's so incredibly exciting. I mean, I when I was writing it, I, I, I visualized it as a film. I mean, I think I was telling you I really was focusing on setting scenes and I could see them up on a big screen. But I never in a million years um, thought that it was going to turn out to be a film like a blockbuster of this proportion with a top tier director and a star studded cast. That's I, I can only imagine. Um, how, how much input did you get uh, on, on the screenplay or that 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 has to be a very unsettling feeling to, you know, this thing that you worked on for so long and put so much care in and now it's just going to be turned over to someone else to be interpreted um how how does that make you feel you know i had i collaborated um with the screenplay writer and um roberto bentivegna he's a very talented um young italian writer um and director and he like he got it like he you know he he grew up um in london to italian parents but spent you know summers in Italy, in Forte dei Marmi, on the Tuscan shore. And his mother worked for Armani for like 30 years. So he was very, um, really got like the scenes that I was, what I was trying to set. And we had a wonderful collaboration. He asked very deep questions about the narrative and the characters and their motivations. So, so um, I found it to be very positive. Absolutely. Um, The, the book, uh, the re-release of the book has gotten a new cover, which is fantastic. Um, I, I just saw Isn't it. Crazy. Yeah, wild, it's dramatic. so <laughs> it's so crazy. Well, we'll put uh, we'll put that in the show notes of this episode uh, for sure. Um, Sarah, we're going to put links to the book in, in the show notes uh, where if if okay. you want to grab it in uh, physical form and, you know, turn the pages uh, or Kindle edition or audio book. Uh, we'll include all of those there as well as uh, as the trailer for the movie. That's so exciting. Right. Um, if people are just discovering you, is there a place online where they can find all the work that you do? Yes. Yeah, so I have a website, uh, sarahgayforden.com. And uh, there's an overview of my work and the book and the new covers on there, too. And I'll just mention if you um, are posting the audiobook, uh, link to the audiobook, I um, 
I did an updated afterward that kind of updates the highlights of the Gucci story in the last 20 years. And I read that myself on the audio book. So that was oh, so fun. That's, that's fantastic. I, mean, I, I meant to ask you about the, the new content that was added to the book. Um, so what was it like to revisit that and to, to add this chapter to the book? You know, it really was just kind of going back. I mean, this was such a writing the book was such an intense experience and it took me two years and I took a leave of absence. So I felt like I was, you know, I sort of moved beyond my comfort zone. Um, and it felt like a huge risk to me, too, because what if I couldn't deliver it? <laughs> you know, um, and yet it was really it was like a passion project i really just i threw my whole self into it and um and i i felt that going back to it um was great because i felt like i had more perspective on the story and i could be um more efficient also in what i focused on and it also allowed me to reconnect with the many people, you know, that I had had um, been in touch with as I was writing the book. And so it was almost like I kind of reconnected with this community of people who had le- had experience, you know, living, working, interacting with Gucci. And I, I think one of the, the things about the enigma, the mystery of this brand, is that it really has touched people deeply in their lives in different ways and different times. Um, it's not like working for any other company really love it the house of gucci the re-release is available everywhere now we're going to have links to it in the show notes uh also uh we'll put links to your website sarah where people can find you thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today my pleasure thanks so much for having me Hank. now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from richard glebe's the jason crane series he led jason to a small bistro The door set tiny bells to chime as they entered. The place shivered with smells. Coffee, hot chocolate, and croissants. This, he said, extending his arm towards a woman in an apron, is Jennifer. She makes the best scones and is tragically spoken for. He kissed the woman's hand. She was plump in her fifties. She had left one curler to dangle at the back of her head this morning. If it's a tragedy to you, this is the first I've heard of it. She swatted at him with a menu. Why didn't you speak up twenty years ago, lady killer? Jason sat. Jennifer put a glass of water in front of him. And who is this fine gentleman? This, said Hedwick, joining, is my son's great-grandfather's great-great-nephew. That's a lot of greats. Any great-great-great-whatever of Hedwick is great by me. She giggled at her own wit. I'll be back for your orders. Hedwick swatted her rear end with a menu as she left. He made small talk about the bistro, the specials, what was good, the Benedict, or not so, the hanger steak. When their orders came, coffee for both, eggs for Jason, a scone for himself, he got down to business. I met your grandmother about, oh, a year ago. Valerie and I have a mutual interest in old families, particularly old families related to the legend for obvious reasons. Valerie's lived in Terrytown for years, though her family's up near Boston. Now, don't worry. I don't believe all that nonsense about a headless horseman. Valerie's the superstitious one. But the Van Brunts are definitely the family in Irving's story. Hermanus Van Brunt and his wife Agatha were farmers in the village back in 1780 or so. This was during the Revolution. Hermanus grabbed title to lands left by a Tory family who'd been tarred and feathered and shipped back to Britain. Do you know your history? Sure, Tory, loyal to the king. Benjamin Franklin broke with his own son who was a Tory. Smart boy. Traitors to the cause. And that was serious business. The British marched straight through here during the war, chased George Washington off Manhattan and out to New Jersey. And after they were kicked out again, a lot of Tories were kicked out with them. Anyway, the Van Brunts took over some farmland north of Terrytown. They had a son, Abraham, and, of course, their son Abraham married a wealthy heiress, Katrina Van Tassel. Yes, all that is true. It's public record, just like the legend says. My mother left behind quite a few documents written by Abraham Van Brunt, Brahm, in Dutch mostly. He was powerful around here. 
With Katrina's money, he became the biggest stone merchant in the state. He died in 1850. After him, it's Dylan Van Brunt, his son, Joseph, the grandson, then Cornelius, then... Sorry, genealogy is not my thing. No? Why was Eliza doing research on the Van Brunts? She wasn't. She was looking into the cranes. That's what made us such fast friends. I don't get it. We do go back a ways, your family and mine. More coffee? Jennifer appeared at Jason's elbow. Hedwick nodded and she poured. Still not getting it, said Jason. But he did. Hedwick turned to the waitress and Jason knew what he would say. My lady, may I present? He raised his coffee cup, proclaiming, The last descendant of Ichabod Crane. <laughs>